Welcome everybody, I'm Dan Slater. I'm the director of the Weiser Center for Emerging Democracies here at the University of Michigan. Um, and today we're really excited to have this, uh, this round table, uh, which we're having with, uh, with, with two guests. The, our theme for today is reviving democracy globally and locally. And so we're gonna have uh, two presentations and then open things up for, uh, for conversation. Let me uh, try to just do brief introductions and then get out of the way. Um, the, this session, by the way, is being uh, co-sponsored by the Center for Russia, European, uh, East European and Eurasian Studies, uh, CRIS. So thanks for their co-sponsorship. Uh, so without further ado, let me uh, go ahead and introduce our, our two speakers today. Um, first, we have Hari Han. Professor Han is the inaugural director of the SNF Agora Institute the Stavros Niarchos Foundation Professor of Political Science and Faculty Director of the P3 Research Lab at Johns Hopkins University. She, spe she specializes in the study of organizing, movements, civic engagement, and democracy. Her newest book will be published by the University of Chicago Press in 2021, entitled Prisms of the People, Power and Organizing in 21st Century America. And she has previously published three books, How Organizations Develop Activists, Civic Associations and Leadership in the 21st Century, that's one, Groundbreakers, How Obama's 2.2 Million Volunteers Transform Campaign in America, that's two, and Move to Action, Motivation, Participation, and Inequality in American Politics. So we're very fortunate to have Hari here with us today. That is not fair. I can't believe you've written that many books already. That's crazy. Sorry for the- uh, for no, the Nothing is fair. Nothing. The titles are too long. <laughs> with the subtitle, it's hard, you know, because- yeah first because it sounds like six books right. so it's you know so we have to be clear here right i think only charles tilly wrote books without subtitles so um okay so i, I so i think ambassador mcfall will not will not uh, come up looking looking too shabby either as when i read his introduction so michael mcfall is the ken olivier and angela nomalini professor of international studies and political science director and senior fellow at the freeman spogli institute for international studies and the peter and helen bing senior fellow at the hoover institution all at Stanford University. Uh, McFall served for five years in the Obama administration, first as special assistant to the president and senior director for Russian and Eurasian affairs at the National Security Council at the White House from 2009 to 2012, and then as US ambassador to the Russian Federation from 2012 to 2014. He has authored several books in his own right. Most recently, the New York Times bestseller From Cold War to Hot Peace, an American ambassador in Putin's Russia, as well as Advancing Democracy Abroad, why we should, how we can. Um, I'll leave it there, um, but let's just kind of open things up. Again, the theme for today, uh, reviving democracy globally and locally. If people have questions as we go, feel free to type them up in the, the Q&A and I'll just sort of keep an eye on those and we'll turn it over to Q&A after uh, both Professor McFall and Professor Hahn have had a moment to speak. So let's uh, start things off with a more global perspective with Professor McFall. Thanks, Dan. Uh, it's great to be back again. I was uh, at your place three or four years ago, um, actually doing a test run for a book that, that you just mentioned that I published a couple of years ago. And so today I'm actually uh, toying with some new ideas for a book I'm working on right now. I've actually never given this talk before and uh, it was your invitation that prodded it. So I, we, I reserve the right to change my mind about anything because uh, it's early on, but what I wanted to do was tackle what you asked me to do, which is talk about the global. Uh, to do so, I'm going to try to share my screen, which I think I've successfully done. And now I just want to make sure everybody can see those slides. Not yet. Uh-oh. So Derek is, on here. here we go. Now it seems, now we, now we can. Okay, great. Um, and uh, I'm just showing slides because uh, I've, we've all had to adjust with um, Zoom. These slides are not going to be data intensive. They're going to just be a lot of photos so that you can look at the slides while I speak instead of looking at me. Um, so the two questions, should we, can we? This is a book I published uh, 12 or 13 years ago, but a lot has happened and it's actually changed my views about how to answer these questions. But I want to answer both these questions uh, in the year 2021. Um, I think, uh, you know, compared to 15 years ago or when I was last thinking about these questions systematically, there's been a lot of bad news. Obviously, uh, if you look at Freedom House scores, there's been a 15 year decline now in terms of democracies as well as rising autocracies. Uh, America is also in decline, according to Freedom House and other. 
uh, groups that measure these things in the aggregate. Um, and who in goodness name are we to tell other countries how to govern themselves given all of our troubles uh, here at home. Um, and a lot of Americans agree with that. I, I actually, first the international folks, a lot of international folks are not so thrilled with our leadership recently. And then when we go to the Americans, if you look at the Pew uh, polling um, uh, data on this as well, most Americans rank democracy promotion as one of the least important foreign policy objectives for the United States, a poll just taken a couple of weeks ago. So why should we be uh, in this business at all? Um, and here I wanna make three arguments. And just so you all know, I just realized I booted up the wrong slide deck, but uh, I'm gonna work with this one anyway. I'm sure it'll, uh, it'll be mostly the same. Um, three big arguments I wanna start with. First, the moral reason. Uh, paraphrasing Churchill here, uh, democracy is a horrible system of government, but I think it's better than all the rest. Uh, governments, uh, governing uh, institutions that have some relationship to democracy, I think are, are better at protecting basic human rights. There's a correlation between liberalism and democracy. Uh, they're better at constraining the power of the state. Uh, they're better at representing the will of the people. And by the way, the will of the people also want democracy. There's a lot of demand for democracy. Uh, in the world. And their, their democracies are more secure and stable compared to other forms of government. Um, likewise, I think there's some economic advantages to democracies. Uh, they're better at constraining predatory states, controlling corruption. Uh, they facilitate stability, which facilitates growth, although that's a controversial uh, relationship that's a little more complicated than that one bullet point there. Um, and democratic leaders need to produce results to stay in power that creates the right set of incentives compared to other kinds of economic system, uh, political systems. Um, and the last thing I'll say on the moral side is small D Democrats around the world want us to be engaged uh, in supporting democracy. So there's a demand for the United States to do this even if Americans themselves are not that interested today. Um, so in addition to the moral reason, I think there are some economic utilitarian reasons for the United States to want to advance democracy abroad. Just leave the morality out, just for our own economic good. Uh, we benefit from open markets. Open markets uh, tend to correlate with democratic changes. Um, and um, that has been good for the United States in terms of our economic interests. Uh, if you look at, especially over the last 30 years, that has been good for us. I, and I would also say with respect to the debate about China and Russia, especially with China, the idea that supporting economic growth in autocracies, which we used to think was going to lead to long-term economic interest uh, benefit for us, I think has been a questioned hypothesis now, rightly so. And then third, security interests. Um, I think the United States benefits from our own security by seeing more democracy in the world. Uh, I don't think it's a spurious correlation that every enemy of the United States uh, in our history has either been a dictatorship or something approximating a dictatorship. Second, the transformation of autocracies into democracies has made us safer. Uh, you can read those countries in the list there. Third, rising autocracies make us less secure, and that's most certainly true today with the rise of China um, and Russia, I would say. And finally, autocrats are not very reliable allies. Um, my, I, I, I focus when I teach about this on the Shah of Iran, who was a fantastic ally, we thought, during the Cold War for 37 years. But that 38th year, uh, when his rule helped to precipitate a revolution and then theocrats took over, have led to long-term negative uh, security interests for the United States. Revolutions like that don't take place uh, against liberal democracies. So those are, those are the arguments for why we might want to see democracy in the world. Uh, we might want to see it grow, but can we do anything about it? Are we capable of actually supporting it? And here I'm less, I'm less sure of myself than I was before I uh, joined the government. Uh, and, I'm most certainly less sure of these kinds of arguments uh, compared to 15, 20, of course, 30 years ago when we thought the entire world was moving towards democracy. Um, but as I think about it, I have a list that I'm just gonna go through real quick 
And then hopefully we'll dig down in some of these uh, during the Q and uh, question and answer period. Uh, this one I'm just going to leave for the, our expert, uh, but I think uh, uh, you cannot, you cannot in any way, shape, or form talk about democracy abroad if we do not take democratic renewal here at home more seriously. Uh, I experienced this serving as a U.S. ambassador in Russia all the time. That was several years ago, um, and to to my our statements about supporting democracy and human rights in Russia. We heard from that regime, well, what about this? What about that? What about this? What aboutism is what we called it. And that has just magnified and amplified um, uh, over the last several years, especially uh, in the last couple of years here in the United States. So we have to do that. And it's not just good enough for people like me, by the way, to say that and then move on, which is exactly what I'm gonna do now. <laughs> um, we have to marry, I think, much more organically our domestic policy agenda and our foreign policy agenda, something that the Biden administration is aspiring to do. Second, no more military interventions for democratic regime change. Now, this, I actually think historically is a bit of a mis misnomer. The United States is actually, with maybe one or two exceptions, maybe Panama and maybe one other case. I'll, I'll let you, I'm not even going to bring it in because it's so controversial. But most of the time when we use military force, it is not to bring about democratic regime change. It's always for some other more uh, immediate uh, military or security interest. But we have this habit that we never leave uh, countries that we've invaded without trying to install democracies uh, before we leave. Um, and I just think we more, must much more militantly, and I think even programmatically, uh, as Secretary Blinken just did in his speech last week, just say that we are not going to use military force to promote democracy. Third, I think we need to rethink our democracy promotion strategies from the past. Many of those uh, started up in the Cold War, they then they had their heyday in the 1990s, when there were lots of places where uh, our efforts to promote democracy were welcome. Those days are over. Um, and if I would just say one thing for this point, I would say focus on defense and play less offense. Um, and that means, for instance, that when there are democratic breakthroughs, that we should go all in in places like Tunisia and Ukraine. I think we made a big mistake in not doing that when we had democratic breakthroughs in those two countries. Instead of sprinkling little bits of democracy and government assistance all over the world, I would, I would focus it and have democratic dividends for those that break through. That is the moment, after all, when they most want to work with us. Uh, I remember this from my own historical experience, living in Russia in 1992, working for a democratic promotion organization called NDI. We were welcomed as partners. That's the moment when you really want to be focused on uh, your democracy promotion efforts and I would be more concentrated in these moments of breakthrough, not all over the world. Two, backsliding. I think we have to have much more um, seriously comprehensive ideas for how to prevent backsliding, including in multilateral institutions like NATO with respect to Hungary. And right now, with respect to Georgia, I think Georgian democracy is in a lot of danger. We should be focusing our energy on defense, defending what is already there. Um, I'll skip the democracy assistance and autocracies for now, I'll come back to that. This last point I think is also important though. Um, in this new ideological era that we have uh, entered into, in terms of competing with China and Russia around the world, I think we need to retire or, or gradually retire the idea uh, that we in academia call modernization theory. That is first, we're gonna help countries develop and then they're going to become democratic, right? We have an agency for international development that gives aid uh, kind of irrespective of whether they're democracies or autocracies. I think we have to end that process. I think we need to focus on um, promoting development in democracies and realizing that that's a much more synergistic relationship than was once assumed 30 or 40 years ago, let alone back when USAID was first set up in 1961. Fourth, stop supporting autocrats. And you might think this is, what, we, do we do that, really? Um, this is a phrase that my friend Boris Nemtsov, before he was assassinated, 
he was a Russian opposition leader. Uh, he used to always say this. In fact, he said it to President Obama when we met him in 2009. Everybody else at the table were opposition leaders asking what the United States could do to help them. And Boris said, Mr. President, I'm not interested in your help. We got it. We Russians, we got this fight. This is our fight. All we want is for you to stop supporting our enemies. Uh, and indirectly, we do this in many different ways. I won't go through this list right now, but these are some of the ways, rather than supporting Democrats, we might reduce our support for autocrats. Fifth, this is a radical idea that will not happen in the Biden administration for sure. I've floated it with them. Uh, and uh, there's not an appetite for this, but I think if we want to get serious about promoting democratic development, democratic and economic, democratic development and economic development, we actually need a radically new uh, structure for doing this within the US government. And what I would like to see uh, us do is create a new department of sustainable development, uh, like the State Department, like the Defense Department, have a chair at the NSC and its own resources and that is a way to untangle our support for democracy and development abroad from shorter term military interests or diplomatic interests. Um, I, again, I don't think this is gonna happen anytime too soon, but if we're gonna get serious about this, I think this is a time for this kind of radical change. And by the way, I remind our listeners and our viewers, we did have this kind of radical change in the US government back when we were gearing up to engage in what became known as the Cold War with the Soviet Union. If, as many claim, we are now entering a new Cold War vis-a-vis uh, -vis China, I think we have to radically rethink the institutions of our government to engage in that competition. Uh, two more. <clears throat> Six, improving public diplomacy. <clears throat> You know, after the Cold War ended, we thought we'd won the ideological struggle. Everybody wanted to be a democracy. It was the end of history, as my colleague Frank Fukuyama wrote. Uh, by the way, that he, he had that right, uh, and I just did what one shouldn't do, which is to cartoonize a very uh, uh, complex argument. But it was a euphoric time in 1991, 92. Uh, for those of you who are too young to remember it, we thought the whole world was moving towards our ideas, so we didn't invest that much into advancing our ideas about democracy, human rights, rule of law around the world. Now we're in a moment where there's a real struggle for democracy, and so I think we have to get serious again about this, not this engagement of ideas, including through public uh, diplomacy efforts. Um, uh, we have this, play, this office called the Under Secretary for State, uh, for public diplomacy and public affairs. I'm gonna guess that 99% of our viewers have never even heard of this office, uh, let alone knows what it, do, that, what it does. And I think the, the range of activities that fall in this cone at the State Department, all of them need to be drastically uh, expanded, including these kinds of things like people to people dialogue, exchanges, Fulbright. Um, uh, and in addition to that, this office also needs to do more to explain our foreign policy to the American people. And in the instance of what we're talking about today, explain why Americans should care about democracy abroad. We, we take that for granted. We need to focus on explaining our policies abroad, but also within our own country. And then finally, another lesson from the Cold War, uh, we invested heavily back then into understanding the Soviet Union uh, and uh, some of the states within the Warsaw Pact and even some of the um, uh, republics within the Soviet Union. I, I'm a product of that. I learned Polish as a result of those kinds of investments in the Cold War. I think we need to do that again um, in the 21st century. Uh, two more points. Uh, I also think we need to rethink how we invest in uh, what our enemies call propaganda, what I would call US government funded media and strategic communications. We have this giant arsenal of various different organizations. Those are just some of them. And I just think we have to radically rethink the way we play in this um, uh, space. If I could do two things, I would do one, I would privatize or make independent Radio Free Asia, Radio Free Europe. I would pull out Voice of America uh, Africa, Voice of America Latin America, 
and stand them all up as independent uh, organizations with their own boards and create a giant firewall between them and the US government. And then two, I would redirect the Voice of America to go back to one of its original core objectives, which was to explain American foreign policy and to explain America and to stop acting as if it is a media organization. I, that would be my two radical changes for this space. And then finally, just enhancing diplomacy, uh, uh, generally speaking. Um, uh, over the years, especially after September 11th, there was too much military, too much intelligence groups. Uh, these are all friends of mine, so I'm not in insulting anybody, I hope, of uh, defining our, our foreign policy I think we need to change that. We need the diplomats to play a bigger role, um, both in defining our diplomacy uh, and, as well as implementing it. And I have some radical ideas that I'm not going to try to go into because I only have two minutes left about how to reorganize, but we'll come back to that if you're interested. Finally, re-engage in multilateral institutions. Um, the Chinese are doing this and they're propagating their worldviews. We've got to show up and I think advance democracy, human rights, and, and universal values, not just American values, within all of those institutions that we have recently abandoned. And then finally, I'll just remind you that the moment we're in now may seem unique. 15 years of democratic decline, rising autocracies, uh, but, and I don't wanna pretend I know the future and nobody should listen to anybody that tries to make long-term uh, uh, predictions about power or ideas in the international system. Um, but I'll just remind you that over the last 50 years, we've had these other moments before. Uh, we most certainly had it in the 1930s when I think we dropped down to 12 democracies in the world. We had it again um, uh, after uh, the World War II ended and the, we lost China and it looked like the whole world was becoming uh, communist. The 70s, again, you had another spike all over the world when we were seen, we were losing in uh, Southeast Asia, we were losing in Southern Africa. We had a lot of problems here at home and it seemed like the correlation of forces as the Soviets called them was moving in favor of communism and not democracy. Uh, even in the 80s, we worried a little bit about the Japanese rising and that turned out to be a false uh, worry. And therefore I would just caution about predictions of permanent American decline or permanent global democratic decline, uh, at least for now. And the last point I'll make um, is just to remind you when you say, well, we don't have any business telling people around the world what they should do. I want to remind you, because I, I engage with people around the world, small D Democrats, I call them, pretty much every single day because of Zoom. And I want to remind you, they're not done in their fight for democracy. The Thais aren't done, the Russians aren't done, the Burmese aren't done, the Belarusians aren't done, the Iranians aren't done, the Hong Kongers aren't done, the Zimbabweans aren't done, even some Americans aren't done. But for all of those countries I just skipped about, uh, let me tell you, they all want us to be engaged. Uh, they don't necessarily want the government of the United States of America to be engaged, but they want small D Democrats from around the world to unite. Uh, and so when you hear that the world doesn't want us to be engaged in these kinds of issues, remember you tend to hear that from the Putins of the world, from the theocrats of the world, from the communist party of the world. You don't hear it from those people that I just raced through. Uh, I think there's quite a bit of demand for American engagement in this agenda right now. And with that, I'll stop. Thank you for being so patient. Well, thanks, uh, Ambassador McFall, for a fantastic presentation. Um, before I turn things over, let me just say that um, for those of you interested in these themes of, of democracy promotion, uh, that WCED did a roundtable a little over a year ago before we went into lockdown on the theme of is democracy promotion dead? Uh, and we also did a, uh, a, a newsletter issue of democracy and autocracy, which our, uh, our current postdoc, Matthew Sabool, uh, kind of edited and, and brought to fruition, which is terrific. And maybe uh, Derek might be able to put the, the links to, to those, both the, uh, the session and the, the newsletter into the, to the chat for the, for the audience in case they're interested. Um, but uh, without further ado, um, let's move forward to Professor Hari Han, 
um, for her take on the theme, reviving democracy globally and locally. Great. Um, well, first of all, thank you so much for inviting me to be part of this conversation. It's a real honor. Um, so thanks to Dan and Derek and the whole team. Um, and also it's great to um, follow the ambassador because I think actually I agree with him on almost everything that, um, that he said. And so I wanna pivot us from thinking about reviving democracy globally to focusing a little bit more on what it might mean to think about reviving democracy locally, um, which as um, the ambassador pointed out, you know, we've got to get our own house in order if we're going to be doing any of the work that um, he describes abroad. So what does that mean? Um, so as I was reflecting on this theme, um, I was reminded of a quote, um, you know, George Orwell um, was, wrote in, um, I think it was like 1932, sort of between um, the first and second world war, you know, he wrote a letter to a friend and he said, you know, the old life that we're used to is being sawn off at the roots. And it feels like we're in the kind of moment like this too, whereas as we think about democracy or the question of how we organize ourselves as a society, that we have to think about it in the context of the fact that the fundamental kind of economic and social structures that have governed our um, society for a long time are fundamentally changing. And I think that's creating a level of uncertainty that conditions the way we might think about what we need to do to revive democracy. And so as we think about uh, reviving democracy, you know, in this moment of profound, um, you know, societal change, I think I wanted to kind of focus on this question of what does it mean, especially in the United States, to think about democracy as an organizing prin principle to which people will commit, right? Like as the ambassador pointed out, if you look at the polling data, it's actually quite low right now that are, and that people are willing to give up a tremendous amount um, as it, when we think of traditional small d democratic norms in order to get their way, in order to win, quote unquote, in politics, like there are all sorts of trade-offs that people will make where they'll sacrifice democracy. And so what does it mean to kind of recreate those commitments that we need to make democracy work? Um, so we think about the kind of problem of the crisis of democracy in that light um, right now in the United States. I would say the reform conversation largely falls into three big buckets. So you have one group of people that are thinking about institutional reforms, right? What are the ways in which everything from money and politics to gerrymandering to um, ranked choice voting or voting rights, like all of those things um, affect the way in which people are able to engage with our political system. So there's one bucket of conversation there. There's a whole second bucket of conversation that is not just domestic, but obviously global in terms of the way in which our changing information ecosystem has fundamentally altered the way in which people communicate and um, get information and learn about what's going on in politics and democracy more broadly. And so there, there's a bucket of work around this question of how we redesign the internet for the public good, essentially. Um, and then the third is what I would put into a bucket that I'm gonna call kind of this challenge of restoring democratic legitimacy or, demo or, or commitments. And, Part of what I wanna argue is that those are like, th that bucket is like the roots of the tree for the other two changes that we make, right? So we can recreate, the, we can redesign the internet, we can get rid of gerrymandering, we can sort of reform the institutions that we have. And all of that work is fundamental to achieving, I think the outcomes that we want. So I'm not, I don't mean to minimize any of that at all, but that I think sometimes um, it's not always true that just because we build it, they will come, <laughs> right? So we can redesign, our democratic system, we can make it easier to vote, we can do all the things that need to happen, but we still have to grapple with this question of what will make people kind of commit to and want to engage with the system that we create. And I think when we think about the challenge of, of commitment and legitimacy, then there's sort of three aspects, uh, or I guess sort of two other aspects of that that I want to sort of highlight. Um, one is that right now we're in this moment in, the, in America, I think, where we're grappling in a real way for the first time of what it means to really create a democracy that, that is a multiracial, multi-ethnic democracy, right? Where for so many years, the United States has operated by essentially excluding um, large groups of people. And now it's having to sort of grapple with that in a new way. Um, and, you know, and so, and, and that kind of fundamentally, I think threads through this question of how we think about the cultural roots of what makes democracy work. So, I wanna focus on that question and then sort of say, okay, I think there are three kind of main points that I wanna make on what the things are that we can do on how we create this culture that helps people commit or recommit to democracy. And so here are the three points. The first is, I think we, we have to invest in civil society. And the reason why I think we have to invest in civil society is because the micro practices of how we engage with each other fundamentally determine the macro changes that we're able to make. And I think 
too often, we don't make that link between the micro and the macro. So that's sort of one point that I want to get back to. The second is, what does it mean to invest in civil society? And here I want to focus on this idea that the strength of civil society is a function of structure and not just habits. So I think too often when we think about reinvesting in civil society, we think about it in the context of social capital and a set of habits that we want people to inculcate. But I want to make the argument that we can act that actually it's a function of the structures that we create, and those are structures that we have agency over. Um, and then the third, which is the last piece of, of what I want to talk about, is um, so what does that mean for what we can actually do? And here I just want to postulate a few ideas um, and that range from actually very doable and actually not so doable, but we'll see, but I'll throw them out there anyway. So starting with this first thing, um, so why invest in civil society? Um, so, so I think often when we're when you're in, when we're in conversations about democracy reform, um, investing in civil society can feel so small, right? Because it's like, well, I can work to pass HR one and restore voting rights, or kind of you know make these big macro policy changes that are going to make a sweeping change across the way across the United States in terms of the way democracy is practiced. And the investments in civil society always feel very little relative to that because they're necessarily diffuse and they're necessarily decentralized right? because that's part of what makes um, civil society work. But I think it's vitally important for um, several reasons. The first is this idea that um, democracy is like a muscle, right? So people aren't born citizens and, and by citizens, I don't mean the leak by, in terms of their legal status, but in terms of having the kind of habits and commitments and proclivities that it takes in order to engage in um, democracy for the common good, that those are a set of habits, proclivities and behaviors that are learned over time, right? And so in some sense, those are, can be learned in places like schools and families and things like that, but they're often, a lot of the research shows, you know, learned in that kind of interstitial spaces in which people come together that may not actually even be explicitly political spaces, but are places where people learn those habits of coming together. So the first thing is just this idea of that we need people need a gym right they need places to go to where they can develop that muscle. Um, the second is what I think of as the political economy of democratic norms and behaviors right and so. There are, a lot, there are a set of democratic norms and behaviors that we might think of as being um, important to making democracy work, commitment to pluralism, tolerance, um, you know, engagement with community, commitment to the public good, like all of these different kinds of things. And we know that all of those things are in decline right now, but what are the conditions under which people are willing to commit to those pro-democratic norms. And I think often we think about that in psychological terms. So we think of, you know, what are the personality characteristics or the individual traits that might make someone more or less likely to commit to tolerance or, um, or inclusivity or a pluralistic um, community or things like that. But I think increasingly what we're seeing is that there are more and more evidence that there's actually kind of a political economy around that, right? So um, here I'm thinking of a study um, where a group of political scientists did, um, you know, a, they surveyed like 100,000 people across Latin America and Africa, across these emerging democracies, and found this really strong relationship between people's willingness to commit to democracy and their own sense of their economic mobility, right? That like, if people are more willing to commit to democracy and give up uncertainty over outcomes, which is what democracy entails, if they have some certainty of their own kind of like baseline economic status. And so in that sense, I completely agree with what the ambassador is saying is that the, the sort of economic revitalization and democracy revitalization, excuse me, are inextricably intertwined. Um, but a second piece of that that I think we have less research on, and this is an area where I think we should do a lot of research on, is what is the relationship between people's orientations towards self-governance and their commitments to these same democratic norms and behaviors, right? So not only do I have to feel like I don't, that I have a baseline level of economic comfort for my family, right, in order for me to commit to the kind of democratic behaviors that we want, but I should also feel like I have some level of voice, right? That I, there is some venue in which my voice actually matters so that even when my side loses, when my candidate loses, when my party loses, when the policy outcomes that I want um, aren't the, the one that win, quote unquote, that I have venues in which I can um, continue to exercise voice and feel like I still have agency in society. And so that's the sort of counter, um, countervailing trend to this idea of like rule or die, right? Which is a sort of more um, anti-democratic sort of behaviors that we might see in some places. And so I think that often the question is then where are those places of self-governance that people 
are able to experience. Well, so certainly voting is one of them. And obviously that's fundamental to making democracy work. But you know, if democracy is only something that people experience every two to four years when federal elections come around, then no one's developing that those habits, right? No one's going to the gym in between. And so again, that's where civil society comes in as a venue, not only for engagement, but as a venue for self-governance. Um, and then the third is just, I think, um, this just kind of underscores things that we've already talked about, which is the idea that, you know, democracy is a fundamentally more open system than, um, than other systems. And so how do we turn that into kind of an asymmetric advantage um, for the United States if we think about it from the perspective of security questions? And it seems that really, um, you know, in the absence that what you need is a democratic system, the openness of democracy becomes um, an advantage if you have a strong culture and a set of, that unites a set of like habits and practices and behaviors through which people become the guardrails of democracy itself. And all that I think is enacted through civil society. So. So that's sort of like one bucket of considerations for like, why should we invest in civil society? Then the second is, okay, so if, if we buy that, then what does it mean to invest in civil society? And so here's where I wanna focus on the question of structure as opposed to just habits or behaviors. So, um, you know, again, obviously social capital and like a lot of these other kind of notions that people think about when they think about civil society are fundamentally important to what makes civil society work, but how are those realized? And um, I think that too often, and especially nowadays in a moment where um, we're in a sort of anti-hierarchical sort of decentralized network moment in the way that we think about a lot of structures in society, we underestimate the importance of structure to making civil society work. And so why does structure matter? So first I wanna draw on just Albert Hirschman, kind of famous, um, I mean, I love his book, Exit, Exit Voice and Loyalty, right? And the notion that, you know, the difference between political organizations and market organizations is that, you know, in political organizations, in, in market organizations, people um, operate through the logic of exit, right? So if I don't like checks, then I go buy Cheerios, right? If I don't like your product, I just simply go buy another. But in political organizations, in order to make them work, people have to, it has to operate through the logic of voice. So if I don't like something that happened, then I need to be willing to sort of commit and stay and exercise voice or fight for the kind of outcomes that I want. And how do we create those kind of organizations? You don't create venues of voice unless you have structures through which people are able to engage in the kind of governance behaviors that they need. And I think so often, so many of our civil society organizations nowadays in the United States have become emaciated to the point where they're essentially what Theda Scotchpool calls these kind of professionalized organizations where the constituencies themselves don't actually have voice, right? Instead, they tend to be run um, through staff-driven initiatives where they've lost a lot of the kind of purpose that they originally had, where they become a sort of mechanism through which that kind of Hirsch, Hirschmanian, I don't really know what the right adjective is, how you adjective, adjectivize his name. But anyways, where that Hirschman notion of voices is lost. And so there's a way in which organizations that are doing it are countercultural because they require a kind of investment of time and willingness and commitment to sort of deliberation that doesn't, that isn't as common in, in the other kind of organizations. But I think that, um, but that's, that, that's, I think that's fundamental to sort of the question of um, revival. So how do you sort of then get people to invest in, in that kind of work? And here, I just want to um, flag. So, you know, some, co-authors and I have a book coming out, um, hopefully in like a month or two, we're not sure exactly when it's gonna come out, um, that basically asks this question of, you know, if we were to sort of look around right now, um, not especially, certainly in the United States, but, um, but even around the world, it feels like we're in a protest moment where you see all sorts of people kind of pouring out into the streets and all kinds of activism happening, but very often doesn't lead to any change. Right? Like that's the sort of null expectation is that people can pour into the streets and nothing will happen. And so what if we were to examine the outliers in the United States and say, what do we learn if we look at the organizations in the US that in this moment where there's this broken link between participation and power, where government responsiveness has gone down, that you actually see organizations that have broken through and been able to kind of achieve the sort of political influence and power that, that they want. What do we learn about those organizations, right? And the null hypothesis in a sense is that there's no commonality across them, right? That they were all idiosyncratically lucky in different ways, either a unique set of political circumstances or a gifted leader or something that happened that enabled them to kind of break through and break the trend. 
And what we found was that they're actually, in doing this um, study that we um, write about, is that at least if we look at the organizations in the US, there actually were a clear set of commonalities that, em that emerged. And the commonality that emerged essentially was this idea of what is the extent to which the organization had an adaptable set of resources that it could draw on in moments of challenge, right? So no protest movement wins on the first try, right? They always get um, challenged by the sort of political targets that they're working with. And so the question is not so much like how good was their strategy at time one, but it's more when they're challenged at time two, what do they have to fall back on? And the answer to what they had to fall back on for grassroots organizations is how adaptable were the people with whom they were engaged. And for organizations that built constituencies that were um, only engaged around like one issue or one candidate, often they didn't have the flexibility within that constituency to pivot as their political circumstances piv pivoted. You know, but for organizations that had people engaged, not necessarily through commitments to an issue, but instead commitments to each other and through this like inner interlaced kind of set of relationships with each other, they had both the kind of communications infrastructure and the flexibility of the resources that they needed to adapt over time. And so those kinds of characteristics are the characteristics that I'm referring to when we sort of talk about the fact that not all forms of engagement are the same. So when I'm talking about reinvesting in civil society, it's a question of how do we reinvest in civil society organizations that create the kind of venues of voice that have people engaged in, in relationship with each other so that they develop the kind of flexible, pragmatic kind of approaches that we saw in a lot of the organizations that were most successful at breaking through. Um, and so the third thing I know that I'm coming up on time um, that I'll say is so, Finally, what are some of the implications then if we sort of take this idea that we need civil society to kind of create the sort of cultural habits that we need to kind of make democracy work and make institutional reform work. And second, that in order to invest in civil society, it means investing in the kind of structures that enable civil society. So what are some things that we can um, actually do? So I want to start here by um, one of my, I love this book by Liz Clements um, called The People's Lobby, where she looks at um, uh, a political reform during the progressive era at the turn of the 20th century, right? And she looks at women, farmers, and labor, and she's kind of asking the question of how is it that um, constituencies or groups that didn't even have the right to participate in the political system were able to change the very rules of the game by which the system is, is, is made, you know? And, and we're in a slightly different moment right now, but the idea is that how was it that, were that these groups that were formally excluded from formal politics were able to kind of make the sort of wholesale change that we make? And that's the kind of, I think, reinvestment in society that we need. And the answer that she, she gives is that basically it's the organizations that were able to kind of hold the tension between pragmatism and idealism, right? Both in the kind of um, practices that they engaged and the ways in which they cultivated their constituency that were best able to achieve the outcomes that they were seeking to achieve, right? So she's got these great stories of women's organizations, for example, that were um, lobbying members, uh, elected officials in the state house. And she had, um, you know, elected officials who were you know, like writing letters or, you know, kind of, you know, saying things where they'd talk to their colleagues and they'd say, you won't believe what's happening right now. Like there's a woman and she's in my office and she's asking for things, you know, and, and it was like so unheard of at the time. Um, but what made these women's groups successful was that they had styled themselves after business lobbies that elected officials were, were familiar with, right? And so it was that idea of sort of adopting a set of organizational repertoires very pragmatically that made them um, legible and familiar to the political targets with whom they were working while they were advancing a more feminist agenda underlying that, you know? And so it was the ability to kind of hold the tension between both of those things that um, shaped the kind of um, success that they were able to have. And so this kind of circles back to this idea that when we think about investing in civil society, we're not just talking about all civil society, right? It's sort of civil society that engages a certain kind of practices and behaviors that help cultivate the sort of democratic norms, commitments, and so on um, that we want. And um, so what are some, what are some organizations that are, are places that, um, that are able to do that? So I'll just sort of say a couple things. Um, with some colleagues here at Johns Hopkins, um, we did a survey that was a nationally representative survey of um, adults way at the beginning of the pandemic. So this is like March of 2020. And the survey was mostly about pandemic response and things like that. But one thing we did ask in that survey was, um, 
what is the community, do you have a civil society organization? We didn't use that language, but you know, do you have a civil society organization that you're committed to? Like what's the most, what's the organization you're most committed to? And so people would name an organization and then we asked them characteristics of that organization. And what was interesting is that 44% of people said the organization that's most important to them is an organization that's ideologically heterogeneous, right? So it's one that sort of pushes people out of their echo chambers. It's one that kind of is, is bucking some of the trends of, of what we see. Um, you know, and so I think there's a hunger that people have for kind of re reviving the kind of civil society organizations that um, might be able to cultivate the kind of democracy that we want. And historically, government has done those kinds of things. And so um, there's an organization that a lot of people haven't heard of called um, the NCOC, um, the, the National Conference on, I think it's Citizenship, which was a congressionally chartered organization that was created in the post-World War II era when um, you had a lot of veterans that were coming back and, and Congress wanted them to invest in their community. So they created a nationally federated structure through which um, veterans could essentially engage with their communities. And over time, that beca it became much more than a veterans organization. That instead, essentially it was a sort of like a civil society organization that existed in every state and every community across the US that then had this sort of structure that went up to um, national government and every year, you know, they would come together and they would meet in DC and, you know, someone from Congress would come and speak to them and it just sort of created the kind of venues for voice that we're talking about. And that was something that Congress was able to help create by creating this national charter, essentially, that both created a funding stream for the organization, but then set it up as an independent 501c3. And so I think those kind of mechanisms historically do exist that we have the opportunity um, to begin to revive. Um, and then the last thing, just because this is a sort of pseudo academic venue that I'll just sort of say is that I also think that as researchers that we have a role to play. So for example, um, a lot of times when I talk to people about in reinvesting in civil society, they're like, oh yeah, like my barber's sister-in-law knows someone who does has this great organization that they're a part of, you know, but no one has like a full picture or a full map of what actually is going on. And I think now we have um, through tools of modern data science and computational um, tools, like we have so much better, more information that we could use to actually create a better map of civil society so that we actually have a picture of the whole elephant. So if you're someone who wants to invest in reviving it, we can sort of think about how we can more strategically make those investments as opposed to just relying on your barber sister-in-law to tell you where the good organizations are. So I think that there's lots of things that are low hanging fruit that we have opportunities to work on um, you know, if it were something that we wanted to do. So I will stop there. Terrific. Thanks so much for those comments, both of you. It's really, really fantastic, right on theme. Um, so I wanted to take a, take a couple minutes and try to, to bring the two themes together a little bit, the two sort of levels, um, kind of inspired by different remarks that, that both of you have made. Um, and the one I want to start with is the, the question of polarization, um, or the question we could also think of as the question of rivalry. Okay, rivalry between countries, polarization between different groups within within the United States, um, and so I'm sort of struck here by a couple of things in in uh, Ambassador McFall's presentation, especially. So one was the the argument that it's no longer in America's interest for Russia and China to experience economic development, perhaps because we're moving away from modernization perspective in which development should lead to democratization. And I was also struck the, in the, the image you showed of protesters who were protesting about HR1 and gerrymandering and DC statehood. And in all of those cases, I think these tend to be people protesting against you know, forces within the Republican party in particular that are opposing um, you know, what people would think of possibly as, as reviving democracy. And, and I guess what I wonder is when we think about those either locally or globally who seem to be opposed to democratic revival, do we want them, do we want them weakened or do we want them confident? Because if on the one hand, if they're weakened, you could say, well, we can push through these revivals. But on the other hand, you know, whether it's Russia, whether it's China, whether it's the Republican Party, maybe to the extent that they're confident and to the extent they're thriving, then they'll feel less need to try to play a play a role of, you know, perhaps trying to block some of these democratic revivals. So whether locally or globally, how do we think about polarization, rivalry, those who we think are opposed to the democratic revivals we seek? Either of you can go first. So either of you want to take a, take a stab? Too good of a question for me to try to answer. So Hari, why don't you go first? Sure. I'll, uh, either way, what do you think? Um, yeah, I mean, I'm happy to. So. Um, 
you know, so I, I will say like, I, you know, I, I, so here's, what, here's the question is, I, I guess like, so what do we mean by polarization to me is the first question, right? So are we just thinking about kind of like Dem, Republican, like left, right divides and, um, you know, in, you know, obviously we're in a moment right now where what it means to be a Republican and what it means to Democrat is sort of changing, right? Like the working, you know, Democrats used to be the party of the working class and now it's really the Republicans that are sort of shifting in that way. And so we see all these different kinds of reconfigurations that are happening, at least in the United States. And to me, that raises the bigger question of, um, you know, you know, is, is, is the right question sort of um, how we think about kind of like the left-right divide or sort of pro-democracy or anti-democracy, or is it more like how we think about the difference between people who see themselves, and this is going to be like super Tocquevillian, so I just apologize in advance, but, um, you know, see themselves as kind of like consumers of democracy or people who have their hands in the levers of change, you know, and I think that, you know, as we think about the kind of people who are most anti-democracy right now is people who are feeling most left behind by all the changes that society is, is, is that that's being wrought by society, by changes in society, you know? And so if we were to imagine a socio-political economic system that was able to um, bring larger groups of people into the fold and help them feel like there are ways in which they have their hands on the levers of change, does that change people's orientations to democracy itself, you know? And does that change the way we think about um, what it means to engage with people who are, you know, on the other side or, or, or something like that. And so I guess for me, like I, like I would love to, you know, I'd want to like step back and, and think about that bigger question of the, of the kind of the, the political economic forces that are underlying the divisiveness that we see. Um, and then, and then think about the solution alongside that. Yeah, because it strikes me that we could think of these things in terms of confidence building measures, right? So to what extent, and both of you, I think in your presentations put a lot of emphasis and rightly so on how do we gather the forces that want to see democratic revival? And it makes me just think about the, you know, those, those opponents then, or to what extent are confidence building measures with those, those we see as opponents, you know, part of the, part of how we actually revive democracy, meet less resistance to reviving democracy, perhaps. Right. Yeah, I mean, great answer. And uh, just had a couple of thoughts. I mean, one, just on the, the national security piece of it, um, polarization in America makes us weaker abroad. So uh, we experienced that the last four years when we're fighting amongst ourselves and we're inwardly looking. It's Trump against the world. Uh, we're not thinking about engaging in the world. And I, I can just tell you, even personally, you know, I'm known as an international relations type of some sort or Russia specialist. I spent a good chunk of the last four years engaged in the fight for democracy inside the United States. Uh, you know, if you did an analysis of my tweets, I'll bet you 90% of them were about polarization in America. So that that's axiomatic, I think. And and our our enemies or our competitors took advantage of that, uh, that because of that polarization internally. And there, there are some folks out there that think well, that's why we need a new Cold War. And uh, I have a couple of colleagues here at Hoover that say this, um, you know, if we just have a new enemy, then it's going to bring us all together. And I think that's completely insane. I just don't see uh, the, the polarization in America rallying together to fight a common en enemy. But that's a big difference between now and the Cold War. Uh, we do not have that shared set of commitments to, to basic threats. And and, and you know, the debate on China, you're going to see it. My prediction is no matter what President Biden does on China, doesn't matter what he does, the policy doesn't matter. Uh, for the next four years, he's going to be accused of being soft on China, uh, at least over at Fox News now um, and in the run up to the election. And so so and that polarization means we won't have a national strategy for dealing uh, with China. The second thing I want to add, though, um, you know, we have a group that studies polarization here. In fact, one of your former colleagues, uh, Ana Jamalabusa, who we stole from the University of Michigan, uh, is uh, uh, the leader of it. Uh, I, I participate, and Frank Fukuyama and Didi Kuo and some others, uh, looking at the transnational connections of these groups, right? And um, it's it's a complex story. It's not it's not an easy story. It's not a black and white story. So I'm not going to try to uh, make it a black and white story. Uh, there are, and, and we call our project global populisms on purpose, right? We add the S so that we don't uh, superimpose that this is one transnational movement altogether. In, in different countries, there are different things that are driving 
polarization, right? Sometimes it's economic stuff, sometimes it's identity politics, and sometimes those come together. Um, but there is something uh, with respect to the countries I'm looking at, China and Russia in particular, uh, in this space, there is this new transnational ideological group that is uh, anti-liberal. Uh, and when I say liberal, I mean small l liberal, not, not liberal in the American sense. Um, and, you know, Putin, if you look at like what Putin thinks about the world, uh, he thinks the United States set up a liberal international order to benefit us. By the way, he's right about that. Uh, with that, with that was a motivation for it. But then the rest of it gets a little more complicated. Then he thinks it's all uh, to advance our hegemony and to assault against sovereignty. And then he adds, uh, you know, in a more normative way that it's, you know, assaulting conservative traditional values in Russia that he thinks are antithetical to Russian culture and values, right? And, you know, 10 or 15 years ago, he was talking about this stuff as a president of Russia and trying to mobilize his electorate along those lines uh, and did so, has done so rather successfully, by the way. Um, by the way, if you looked at his electorate and the, the basic uh, cross tabs, they look a lot like Trump's electorate in terms of, you know, uh, things that might predict a Trump supporter. They're very similar to Putin's. Um, but now he's gone on the offensive on that. Uh, and he's decided that this is a, a movement to, to create connectivity with like-minded people like that. Uh, so sometimes it's with governments, Viktor Orban in Hungary's famous person, Salvini in Italy. Uh, uh, sometimes it's people kind of on the fringe of the governments, uh, Nigel Farage in the UK, Le Pen in France, although she may not be on the fr fringe for much longer. But it's also with NGOs, civil society, or, or a civil society, or, or non-civil society, uh, where they're, you know, through the Orthodox Church, through Russia houses, they're trying to make these connections, uh, including here in the United States. Um, and, and that's a new ideological thing that, that I don't think we've really focused enough attention on. We shouldn't exaggerate it, because I, I, I think the other liberal ideas are much stronger around the world. But this is a, this is a fight that reminds me of the, the old communist fight because communists wanted to appeal to people based on their class, right? It was a transnational movement around the world and they had allies all over the world, including in, in the United States from time to time. This movement is more about identity politics, uh, populist, nationalist, conservative, uh, stuff and sometimes racial things too. By the way, the fringe groups that that the Putin folks support are uh, openly racist and and fraternize and and interact interact with racists around the world, including in the United States. But it's transnational. It's a divide within societies that Putin is seeking to foment. You know, first and foremost, because he thinks by fomenting it, it makes his enemies weaker. So you know what they've done in our country. But I actually think it's a, there's more to it than just making us weaker. I think there, he thinks of it as this new social movement of which he's one of the international leaders. Okay, great. Um, so just one, one second question that also, again, trying to bring these two levels of analysis together. So I was, I was really struck by the metaphor that, that Hari used about you know, democracy being a muscle, and so we need a gym where we can get together, and this idea that our micro practices have macro consequences. And so... I've just been thinking about the fact that, you know, I mean, a lot of the institutions that we have in the world are not democratic at all, right? So, you know, whether we think locally, we think about places of employment, we think about our own universities, these are not democracies, right? If we think globally, you know, the United Nations is not a democracy, like the, the Security Council doesn't make decisions in a, you know, in a democratic way. And I guess I just wonder, just to sort of think creatively here, whether globally, locally, is part of reviving democracy you think should be the idea that we need to extend democracy into new domains, the places where there just isn't enough democracy, all kinds of international institutions. I mean, there's the democratic deficit in the European Union. I mean, should we be thinking about places where we just don't have enough democracy locally or globally? Um, and part of our agenda should be where those places are and where you know, we think that would be you know, steps in the right direction. Uh, 
Well, so I can jump, I'll jump in here um, with, um, with a little bit. So, um, so this is, I'll, I'll sort of start with like a little bit of a story and then kind of link it back. So, um, so I've actually been doing a lot of research lately with um, evangelical mega churches in the United States. And so these are um, huge churches in the US. Um, the largest one gets 80,000 people per weekend to show up um, every weekend. So they have a scale that outstrips like any political organization um, that we have by far. Um, the one that I've studied the most closely has, for, has 40,000 people per week um, that show up. And this is in the Rust Belt of the United States. So it's not like, you know, Berkeley, California or, <laughs> or anything like that, right? And, um, and what's really interesting to me is that um, the evangelical church, if you follow the data at all, is, is, um, it has a lot of very illiberal, and here I'm using liberal in the same way the ambassador did, you know, forces within it. And they have been at the center of a lot of the um, very anti-democratic kind of um, movements that have been coming up um, in the United States. And, um, you know, a church of 40,000 people definitely has some people that subscribe to kind of the white Christian nationalist sort of forces that are really at the center um, of that movement in the evangelical church, but also has a lot of people who don't, you know? And so you don't get to a church that big without having some heterogeneity within it. And one of the things that's been really interesting to me is trying to talk to the people that are really grappling with what it means to be evangelical. So these will be people that might theologically believe in the tenets of evangelicalism, but don't, don't feel like they necessarily want to associate with the political brand evangelicalism. And certainly in um, a lot of these large mega churches, you have an, a not insignificant portion of people that um, fall into that category that might not call themselves evangelical on a survey, but for an outside observer behave in many ways are consistent with evangelicalism. And so this question that I've been asking them is like, well, so why do you stay, you know? And, and what's interesting is that so many of these evangelical churches, they have 40,000 people per weekend, but they're spread out across 13 campuses. And then within those 13 campuses, almost everyone belongs to some kind of what they call small group. You know, so it, the small group could be anything from like a Bible study to a group of young 20 year olds that live on the east side that want to go out for drinks on Fridays, you know, and so they're organized on a wide range of different principles, or it could be people that want to talk politics, you know, but that also belong to the church or something like that. And so it's organized around a wide range of different kinds of principles, but essentially it creates a sort of cellular structure within the church. And then what that means is that that cellular structure, I had. What, what I didn't expect to find is actually a, um, a function through which a lot of um, tension is held within the church, you know? So when people feel like I'm mad at my church because they didn't go far enough in speaking out on racial justice, or I'm mad at my church because they went too far on speaking out against racial justice, then instead of leaving the church, right, what they do is they, they discuss that and they argue about that within that little small group that they're a part of, you know? And so that cellular structure essentially enables um, enables a kind of like practice of democracy within a, a faith-based institution. And so it's not a democratic organization. I know that we often think about churches as being, you know, places through which civic skills are developed. And I think that is true, but it's certainly the church does not operate as democracy. You know, like it operates very much like, you know, the pastor is in charge. The pastor tells you what right theological behaviors are. There's a theological board that's in charge of all these things, you know? And so there's nothing small d democratic about those churches, but you know, having this cellular structure allows people to feel like, even if I, I disagree with, it, with, with what the big C church is doing, the fact that I have this space that I can shape my own actually creates a tremendous amount of flexibility. And so when you think about that question of extension, Dan, you know, I think, I don't know that we're at a place where our workplaces are going to be democratic. I certainly don't see universities, you know, becoming um, small D democracies or, or anything like that. But I think we underestimate the sort of way in which some of these kind of cellular units that we're a part of um, can can replace that in other ways. Totally fascinating. That's great. That's great. Mike, do you want to climb, chime in as well? Uh, just a couple of thoughts. I mean, one is um, uh, especially listening to Hari talk about civil society organizations in America. Um, very struck by these patterns in countries I know well about, you know, how, would you call it the civil society groups that get really skinny, theta scotch poles, or, and then they become professional NGOs and they're very disconnected. I mean, that is a problem. That's a global problem. And most certainly in the post-communist world, the part of the world I know the best, uh, that's exactly what has happened over time. Um, and how do you reinvigorate those groups and connectivity to their um, constituents and so that they're not just representing 
20 uh, professional people. And by the way, in that part of the world, a lot of them are funded abroad externally. So they're not even, there's another way that they're disconnected from the people they're supposed to represent. Conversely, um, uh, when you see, you know, I, I'm just thinking of some anecdotally uh, NGOs that I know. Uh, one, I was telling Hari, you know, one is that I, I listen to every day in my household. It's called Moms Rising. It's a group here in the United States that my wife works at and helped to found. And, and as a social scientist, I've been observing them for, you know, about a decade now and thinking about NGOs in America versus the ones that I work with abroad. And what's interesting about their model is that they do have a million members and they take that very seriously and they cultivate that connectivity that, that you know, that they're the gym. You know, I love the, I love that metaphor too, by the way, I'm going to steal that. I'll, uh, you know, the gym, uh, the space. So you exercise that muscle and that then gives them power vis-a-vis -vis either, you know, when they're opposing things as they have done for the last four years, but I would say even more so when they're able to engage with governments and they engage with the federal governments uh, and, and local governments as well. But, you know, in the Obama era, when uh, the, you know, they took engagement with civil society seriously, uh, Moms Rising became kind of the, you know, the darling of the White House because they, you know, when they're pushing for uh, Obamacare, Affordable Care Act, they needed stories from all 50 states. There aren't a lot of NGOs that have, you know, members in uh, North Dakota. Uh, and that, 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 that created a democratizing effect, if you will, on the federal government. So I think revitalizing civil society organizations internally along the, the reforms that Hari was outlining, by the way, that, that, in, anywhere in the world, and then that brings power to democratizing the institutions uh, that you're seeking to do. I, a bunch of smart people saying we should democratize them without pressure from the outside. Uh, you know, my, my prediction is that would not work. But the second thing I wanted to say, and even maybe it's a question because I'm not an expert, um, uh, but you know, I did participate in a presidential campaign a couple of cycles ago. Actually, my first time meeting Barack Obama was at Saddleback Ranch. I don't know if you know that part. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, down in Southern California, Rick Warren's church. Um, uh, and I, I was not there to speak at Saddleback. Uh, he, President, uh, Senator Obama was speaking there, Senator McCain. I was there for the plane ride to talk about Georgia because the Russians had just invaded Georgia. So I'd been on phone calls with them, but it was the first time, uh, you know, they, it was such a big crisis. They wanted me to get on the plane with them. Uh, by the way, and that changed my life for several years thereafter, uh, cause I worked for him for five years, but I remember sitting at this church. It's one, I don't know what the size, but it's, it sounds like the ones you're studying massive tens of thousands of people there. And, Obama's there, McCain's there. And I remember, you know, waiting around before we got on to talk about national security, I was talking to his uh, advisor at the time, David Axelrod, who now the whole world knows. And I was like, David, why, why is Barack Obama here? Uh, this doesn't seem like a place where we're going to win a lot of votes, uh, the naive outsider said. And he said a couple of things. One, uh, the heterogeneity that Hari was talking about is, you know, is within that church. Um, but two, you know, Obama had a theory of democracy that was about engagement of civil society. Remember, he's a grassroots activist at heart. And it was very important for him to be, and by the way, he then, I think, formed this kind of relationship with Rick Warren over the years, where he, did, he knew that he wasn't going to win votes, but he thought it was a very important part of the kind of democracy process to engage with these kinds of groups. Um, and this, the second thing I remember from that period, and this, this gets back another answer to the polarization question, which most certainly I see in other countries, and I wonder if it's true in America as well, is that if you look at data uh, in the countries I know better, um, the societies is actually not that polarized. Uh, individuals are not as polarized as their institutions are or as their media are or as their politicians are, right? 
Uh, remember, Barack Obama got, I think, 48% of the vote in Montana, 2008. I'm from Montana. That's why it matters to me. Uh, and the card, you know, the, the typical story of Montana is they're all incredibly polarized people that, that hate the Democrats and are all racist. And that's just not true. Like, like my, I have uncles and aunts and friends that voted for Trump. That doesn't mean they signed up for all of that polarizing stuff that you see uh, in these other places. Um, and that also, it always makes me wonder, you know, to what extent is this moment we're in in history, this long-term structural thing that we'll look back on and say, well, this was the beginning of the end, right? Or is it just a reaction to this moment? Uh, Trump was a reaction to Obama, you know, these, these, these neo-nationalist groups around Europe are a reaction to this moment. But that maybe the longer term trends are not as dire as, as we might think. And I don't know the answer to that, but it's, it's a question always uh, in the back of my mind. Just one thing I just want, just to, I'll be really quick, just to add on to what um, Mike just said is, um, so I also, I, I mean, in, in addition to that, this is kind of like a both and, I, you know, I also kind of think about like how much of the problems of polarization that we see or the identity politics that we're um, seeing as like a supply side problem versus a demand side problem, right? So is it that like, that's people are inevitably kind of stuck in these sort of like polarized, you know, identity driven kind of things. Or is it there isn't a supply of political parties or organizations or churches or whatever it is that we want to kind of think about that are giving people the opportunity to kind of realize a different kind, a different way of enacting politics. And and at least, you know, the kind of the parts of the, the of you know, civil society that I know best, like I think there's definitely a demand a su supply side problem not to minimize the fact that there are also demand side problems, but that like those things interact, you know? Yeah, I think that's a I great think point. Again, for the, the countries I know better, I'm not, I don't know, I'm just a observer and participant in this one, uh, but uh, you know, the collapse of social democratic parties uh, in the post-communist world in Russia in particular, that space, um, there's this activist, uh, Alexei Navalny, who you probably read about recently, who's, you know, was put in jail again. And if he were on our panel here, because um, I've talked to him about these things over the years, he would, he would say this precisely, that the, what the, it, it was two things. It was, you know, that in his country, it was market reform and neoliberalism got all conflated with democracy. Uh, and social dem democratic parties were crowded out of that. And we, he would say we were a part of that. And by the way, I think he's, there's a, you know, that's a hypothesis for, I, for which I think there is data. But then second, you know, there, the additional problem he has there is there's this, this behemoth called the Communist Party of the Russian Federation that doesn't really do much for that, that, that part of the spectrum and crowds out uh, the NGOs that want to engage on that side. Um, and he very much thinks that that is, you know, the, the, the solution in Russia is a genuine social democratic party that engages with people along this different uh, identity dimension than the ones that they're currently trapped in. Okay, great. So I want to make sure we get a few questions from uh, the audience. We have about 15 minutes left. Um, I want to start with uh, with Mike, and you thought I asked you a tough question earlier. You're about to get even tougher questions. Um, right. uh, we've got uh, one uh, participant, Gage Gerritsen, who um, says we should be playing defense in regards to defending emerging democracies. And with that in mind, how might you advise the U.S. in regards to the current situation in Myanmar? Um, and as if that wasn't tough enough, I want to just pile on a little bit. Um, Matthew Sabul, who I mentioned earlier, our uh, postdoctoral fellow who works on Syria, um, was sort of saying he agrees with your with your comment about using military force, but on the other hand, we were relatively restrained in Syria, and that turned out very poorly. So, can one imagine the more effective way of dealing with the Syria type situations? And then, what what are your thoughts on Myanmar at the moment? You're not kidding. Those are tough questions. Uh, um, uh, I don't have any silver bullet solution. Those are two of the toughest kinds of questions. Which is, what do you do when, uh, you know? You have a coup d'etat. I, I, you know, I've, I've been in the government when that's happened uh, in Egypt, for instance, when I was in the government. Um, so first on Myanmar. Uh, well, the first thing I would say, again, listening to my small D Democratic friends, including one from Myanmar I was just corresponding with two days ago. Um, 
you, sometimes you just have to do what's right, not thinking about whether or not it's going to lead to the right outcomes. Uh, you know, this is a debate we have a lot about sanctions with respect to Myanmar and Saudi Arabia and Russia and Belarus. And, you know, there's always this, instinct, well, well, they don't do any good, so let's not do them. Um, and I disagree with that. I think some, when there's an egregious act, like a coup d'etat, uh, you have to respond uh, with something because doing nothing is, is worse than doing nothing, even, uh, something, even if you know your sanctions are not going to achieve a result anytime soon. So I think the Biden folks are right to focus on it. I think there should be more sanctions, more pressure. And of course, you know, to go back to what I talked about earlier, uh, the more we can multilateralize that, as opposed to the United States being there alone, uh, we should do that. Um, on Syria, you know, I, the book you mentioned that I published a while back, um, the longest chapter in that book is about Syria. Um, it's called Chasing Russians, Failing Syrians. And, um, you know, it's just about our failure. Uh, and we failed, uh, without question, the biggest failure in my mind, of the Obama administration on domestic or foreign policy by far. And, you know, I guess the lesson I would say is, um, and, and let me just say parenthetically, uh, um, it's easy to say we should never use military force, uh, but that's easy to say in the abstract. And then when you're sitting in the White House Situation Room and our intelligence says, you know, Mr. President, we think that if we don't do anything, uh, there will be genocide in Benghazi. Um, then you have a choice. And I supported that choice. I didn't support. I lobbied for that choice. We had to use military force, uh, lesser of two evils. It was not forced to bring about democratic regime change. I, I want to remind people that. Uh, but once you use force, as America knows from a long history, um, a lot of things happen. I was gonna, my mom uses a stronger word uh, <laughs> that begins with S uh, and, and that, that you're not in control of and that's what happened there. In Syria, and I don't wanna pretend that this is a silver bullet either. I wanna be clear about that. It's easy to run counterfactuals uh, in retrospect. Um, but in Syria, I think the mistake was not uh, what we did later in terms of arming the opposition and all that. You know, I, I think I think in many ways that the, the train had left the station by then. Um, I think the real mistake was not pushing harder for an internationalized pacted transition, we would call it from the demo democratization literature, when things were still peaceful. Um, we had a theory that we needed the Russians in order to bring about a transition. That was, our, that was our assessment, that without Russian pressure on Assad, it would not happen. And maybe, you know, maybe that was true. But I thought there was a possibility of doing something along the lines that we did in Egypt, by the way. Right? And later that ended in a, in a bad way, but initially it did not. And that was we reached out not to Mubarak himself, but to people around him to say, you know, this is not going to end well. Um, I, I remember I helped to write these talking points. You know, if you if you don't change the tra trajectory here in Egypt, we said two things are going to happen. Uh, it's going to get violent, and more radical people are going to appear. Uh, so better to to negotiate a transition now to avoid civil war and avoid you know the jihadists from coming. And and that's kind of what happened in 2011. And so we took that argument. Uh, in, with respect to Syria, but we always took it to the Russians first. Uh, we never developed a back channel through the French or even our own uh, intelligence, by the way, with, you know, thuggish characters around Assad who might have been able to be part of a negotiated settlement. And I, I you know, we, we didn't do that for two reasons. One, people didn't think that was an option. So that's, that's an empirical thing. I disagree with that, but but people can look at that uh, in different ways. But two, we also had that we had this. We thought that the regime was going to fall. Our own assessment was that this is moving in the right direction. I'm talking about the peaceful phase here, right back in 2011. And we were kind of non-interventionists. Uh, Barack President Obama is a is, does not believe in American intervention, and and let's not mess this up 
by getting involved if, if we think there's a peaceful trajectory here. And that assessment, I think, turned out obviously not to be true. Yeah, brutal stuff. Um, let me uh, turn back to, to Hari Han with the next couple set of questions from Dave Ari. So one is on the about the role of Facebook. Um, and I think maybe social media more generally, how, how problematic this is um, when we think about reviving democracy uh, locally. Um, and he also asked about, um, you know, coming from the perspective of Wisconsin, about voter suppression, gerrymandering, and the blow that those have struck. And he asked whether he thinks the John Lewis Voter right, Rights Act could help democracy in Wisconsin and the U.S. So, and obviously, uh, Ambassador McFall, too, if you want to chime in on this, questions of, uh, you know, social media, questions of, um, you know, voter suppression. So um, on voter suppression um, and the, like the John Lewis Voting Rights Act and other gerrymandering, I think, so to me, those are reforms that are necessary, but not sufficient, you know, so they're not going to be a silver bullet, but they're absolutely necessary. Um, you know, our voting rights laws have really been um, emaciated, um, you know, over the past, I'm not sure how many years, but certainly in the last decade, especially. Um, and, you know, voting is the most fundamental act that someone can take as, a, as, as, as part of the polity, right? And so if we are making it hard and systematically excluding people from being able to do that, then that's that we don't meet minimum standards of, of a democracy. So, like, I think absolutely we have to do that. Um, you know, same with gerrymandering, that gerrymandering obviously is a tool that's used on both sides of the political aisle in order to try to design districts that favor particular parties. Um, but I say that these things are necessary, but not sufficient in the sense that, you know, a lot of the kind of, a lot of the problems that we see in American democracy, we see all over the world. And gerrymandering, of course, is a uniquely American phenomenon, right? And so, um, so while it is something that we have to work on, I, I don't think that it's necessarily, um, you know, it's, it's not going to be the silver bullet, but yes, like absolutely it's a minimum standard, I think, for things that we, that we have to um, be able to do. Um, you know, on Facebook and social media, so that's that's obviously like I mean, that, this is that's probably the part of the conversation that we've probably spent least time on, where the kind of changing information ecosystem is obviously fundamental, also to all the things that we've been talking about for the last hour. Um, and you know, I have two colleagues at the SNF Agora Institute here at Johns Hopkins who just published an article in um, the Atlantic today about you know like ways that we you know the, the, the I think the title is something like the internet doesn't have to be as awful as it is, you know, that like, you know, there are certain design choices that were made when the internet was set up that essentially kind of created this sort of like unregulated um, environment that um, led to a lot of the, you know, ills that we have. And so I think there are um, a lot of questions about how we might think about both regulating tech companies, but then also redesigning the kind of digit, the online spaces in which people interact that can change the relationship of um, of the tech companies and the sort of, you know, the social media companies like Facebook to the public good and, and democracy um, writ large. Um, you know, I think that's a question where there's, um, you know, there's both a technical challenge of what the right solution is, but then also a public challenge of whether or not the will is there to make the changes that, um, that people want. And I think, um, you know, over the next sort of I see that as like one of the big challenges that's going to be um, coming up, um, you know, over the next kind of five to 10 years. And Dan, just to echo, because it's a huge question, but I did put in the chat, we have a, we have a giant center at the Institute I run that studies these issues. And they just re released a big report yesterday, I think, on disinformation in the 2020 elections. I put it in the chat. Um, uh, and I'm I'm looking at the clock thinking, I'm not gonna try to summarize everything we've been working on in four years, other than to say, um, I completely agree that this is one of the vital uh, questions for American democracy, but global democracy, right? Because all these platforms are used everywhere. Um, and, but I'm an optimist on this. I, I think we, uh, because I actually think, um, through NGOs, through public debate, and I personally deal with these companies fairly regularly uh, here in the Silicon Valley, that there has been a, um, you know, a democratizing, I'm, I'm trying to, I, that's too far. Uh, uh, Google is not, my alphabet is not a democratizing uh, organization yet. Facebook isn't either. They're highly autocratic, but they respond to um, NGOs, they respond to the democratic debate. And we're in a space today categorically different than just 
three or four years ago, getting the right policy solution is hard, right? It's, this is not an easy thing to solve. And there are these path dependent consequences that Hari mentioned that, that are gonna be hard to unravel. But I think it's, a, it's an interesting moment and I, I think we can get this one right. Okay, great. Um, well, I should uh, I, I should say you know that you know hopefully one uh, you, you know one thing that comes out of this conversation you know is that we've got three you know three centers that are very interested in these questions you know democracy globally locally at Johns Hopkins at Stanford University of Michigan so hopefully this can be the start of conversations about how these things go forward uh, you know you know from here so I really appreciated both your sets of comments and the and the dialogue um, I'm sorry we couldn't get to all the questions from the audience but um, our panelists had a lot to say and the main thing we wanted to do was hear the, the, all the, the great insights you guys had to share. So um, without, you know, out any further ado from, from there, I'll just say um, farewell to everyone. Hope everyone enjoyed the, enjoyed the session and we'll be uh, attending the rest of our, uh, our events for the rest of the semester. And, you know, keep track of what's going on with the center that Harry runs at, at Johns Hopkins. They're doing amazing, amazing work. They've just up and, just up and running the last couple of years. Um, and there's always great stuff happening at Stanford too, CDDR, CDDRL. Um, I gave a talk on Myanmar there a couple of weeks ago. Um, so one small benefit of Zoom might be that we can actually, uh, you know, interact more and, and, and talk more, even if it's uh, even if it's virtually. So sorry you guys can't be here. The weather's actually beautiful in Michigan, uncharacteristically. Um, but it was really, really a, a joy and a pleasure to, to hear your insights. And it's great we'll have this online so uh, others can watch it on uh, on YouTube. And thanks to Derek Groom as always for so expertly putting all of this together. Thanks so much for inviting us. This is great. Bye. Fantastic right. conversation. Yeah. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.